You know, I think I've come to realize recently that my favorite kind of Pokemon theories are the terrible ones. I have an ongoing series on my channel spanning multiple videos where I cover Pokemon theories that are so ridiculous that they're obviously not realistically true, but that also make all the sense in the world. These kinds of theories have been super fun to come up with because it just expands what's possible within the world of Pokemon, and to be able to justify wacky ideas like this with cold hard evidence has just been super enjoyable to me, and hopefully to you guys as well, because we're here to do it again with three more terrible Pokemon theories that actually make perfect sense. Fun fact, today's video, in all its fun and glory, has been brought to you quite literally by the support of today's sponsor, Baiyi. As a Pokemon fan, you're probably aware of all the amazing Pokemon merch that's out there, but as a Japanese series, a bunch of it is exclusive to Japan, and importing it can be complicated and expensive. That's where Baiyi comes in. They allow you to buy directly from Japanese websites like Amazon Japan, Yahoo Japan Auction, Mercari, Rakuten, and more, and will purchase or bid for items on your behalf. From there, that's it. Baiyi will send you the product and take all the hassle and extra costs out of the experience. It's basically like having a friend who's visiting Japan and they bring you something back as a souvenir, except you can take advantage of it all the time. In addition to Pokemon merch, there's cool Japanese products of all kinds you can get your hands on this way, so if that sounds good to you, you can follow the link in my description below to check out Baiyi today, and when you do, you'll also get a special coupon for 2,000 yen off your first order, which is around 14 US dollars. Go ahead and give it a look, and a big thank you to Baiyi for supporting the channel and making videos like this possible. Okay, so my first theory is a fun one, because it has to do with a secret Pokemon that we don't know the true identity of. In fact, it sort of branches off another well-known theory in the community that has to do with Wobbuffet. It's long been speculated that both Wobbuffet and its pre-evolution Why Not are not what they appear to be, because it's theorized that these Pokémon's blue bodies aren't actually their bodies at all, and that the real body is actually the tail of these Pokémon. If you look closely at these Pokémon's tails, you'll see that they are a pair of strange black blobs with, even more strangely, eyes of their very own. This makes it seem even more like the tails of these two do in fact have a mind of their own, and it would also explain why these Pokemon can only attack with moves like Counter and Mirror Coat, because their blue bodies are really just punching bags that are meant to protect what this black blob actually is. But it doesn't just stop there, because this mysterious Pokemon has far more going for it than just this. In fact, this little black blob might just be the most powerful Pokemon that we have never heard of. I say this because Wobbuffet isn't the only Pokémon that shields its true identity from the rest of the world. There are other Pokémon that do this same thing in different ways, like for instance, Tangela and Tangrowth, or Shelder. And one additional thing that all of these Pokémon have in common is that their bodies are black blobs that also have the exact same type of eyes. I mean, think about it. Wobbuffet's tail is supposedly the actual Pokémon here, it protects itself by concealing its identity, and its actual body is black and blobby in nature, and it has eyes that consist only of teeny tiny pupils. All of these traits also apply to Shelter, Tangela, and Tangrowth, so do you really think that that's a coincidence? I don't think so at all. In fact, I think all of these Pokémon are actually the same Pokémon, which is this black 
blob, and somehow it is able to adapt in order to protect itself and become any type that it needs to. For example, in its water-type form, it becomes what we know as Shelder. In its psychic-type form, it becomes what we know as Wobbuffet, and in its grass-type form, it becomes Tangela. And just like we often see in the real world, these Pokémon were probably just misidentified as different species due to their concealed nature, when in reality, they're all different forms of the same species, and that species is this mysterious black blob. Next up, I actually have a theory that concerns Pokémon Scarlet and Violet. At the time of writing this, we only have access to the reveal trailer for these games, so basically almost nothing is known about them. That could theoretically change this theory once more info is released, and more probably will be by the time this video comes out, but if you're hearing me talk about this right now, that must mean that we're good to go and I didn't need to replace anything. Even though we don't know much about Scarlet and Violet at the time that I am writing this, one thing that we do know is that the region is based on Spain, and possibly the entire Iberian Peninsula. As such, the Spanish influence is sure to play a big role within these titles, and it's exactly why I believe that the Galarian legendary birds, aka Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, are actually from the region of Scarlet and Violet. This is something that I actually touched on in an earlier video, where I speculated that the birds could have been a bit of intentional foreshadowing by Game Freak to Scarlet and Violet, but I also feel like it makes canonical sense as well. First off, one thing we do know about Scarlet and Violet, even with the limited information I have at this time, is that, as I said, it's very Spanish-inspired. This shows up first and foremost in the names of the starters. With names like Sprigatito and Fuecoco, it's clear that these games are going to have a lot of Spanish influence, particularly with Pokémon names. Which is why it's very interesting that Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres also have Spanish-inspired names. Now, obviously it's been that way since the very beginning, but now that we have a Spanish region in the world of Pokémon, it begs the question, why would these Pokémon have Spanish words in their names if they didn't have some connection to this Spanish region? It really doesn't make any sense otherwise now that we actually do have a Spanish region. Furthermore, it's actually implied via the Pokedex that the Galarian forms of the birds are actually the originals, since it mentions that the traits of these specific forms are what gave them the names Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres in the first place. So, to recap really quickly, these are the original forms of the birds, it's where they get their names, there is now a canonical Spanish region that could legitimately be the source of the Spanish parts of their names, and these forms are Galarian forms, and Galar is based on the UK, which is only a stone's throw away from Spain. Yeah, I think we're getting somewhere. However, the biggest hurdle to this theory is that these Pokémon are obviously labeled as Galarian forms. How can they be Galarian forms if they're actually from this new Spain region? Well, I'll tell you how. It's been known for a while now that the legendary birds are migratory. Their Cantonian forms have appeared this way in the past by being roaming Pokémon, and that's exactly how we see the Galarian birds behave as well. So they have simply migrated to Galar when we see them in those games, and they're coming from their native home, which is the Scarlet and Violet region. And as far as why they're called Galarian forms, well, let me put it this way. 
A migratory bird in our own world is the Canadian goose, and it's specifically called the Canadian goose. But if we look at this map of its range of habitat, almost the entire area where it actually lives year-round is in the United States, yet it's called a Canadian goose. So, these things aren't exactly always one-to-one. -one. In fact, this goose is about to come up even more clutch for me, because if you will look once again at this map, most of Canada, which is this goose's namesake, is where it lives in the summer, meaning that it's effectively seasonal there. But it has still claimed the Canadian name nevertheless. Likewise, if we look at the legendary birds, specifically Moltres and its dex entry in Pokemon Crystal, it states that it migrates from the south in the spring. So, we know these birds like to move north, and what is the UK-based Galar region north of? You guessed it, Spain, and likely the new Spanish-based Pokemon region as well, which means that the Galarian birds are probably called the Galarian birds because they migrate there and because we saw them first in Galar, but in actuality, they are from the new region in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Sometimes with these wacky theories, they actually are so convincing to me personally that I question whether or not I can actually say that they're terrible, or more specifically, not realistically true. One example was that last theory about the birds, and another one is this next one. Now, this one is more of a community-based theory than one of my own creation, but it's still a really fun one, and it has to do with the idea that there is actually a secret Pokeball out there that no one has ever truly seen, and this would be the kind of Pokeball that is designed for carrying items instead of Pokemon. I'm sure you've all had the thought once or twice about why all items in Pokemon games appear as Pokeballs in the overworld, instead of as actual items. Well, truth be told, it's because it's just a game and the Pokeball icon just so happens to be what Game Freak used as the item icon, so there really isn't some deep, bigger meaning to it, but what if there was? What if all the items in the overworld of Pokemon games appear as Pokeballs because they're actually inside special item balls that are specifically made to carry items? This would explain why items appear as Pokeballs first and foremost, but it would also explain another classic conundrum. In addition to the items in the overworld, many fans have also wondered how the player can fit so many items in their measly little old backpack. Like, you can supposedly fit in your backpack Pokeballs, potions, TMs, berries, a bike, a fishing rod, and just about a million other things. That is literally physically impossible, but it wouldn't be if there were an item ball that existed out there that put all of these things within the size of a Pokeball that can fit within the palm of your hand. So, this not only explains a lot, but it also makes a lot of sense, and you would almost even expect this sort of thing from the Pokemon world as well, because if they have the technology to put these giant monsters within a ball for easy storage, do you really think that they would stop there? With this kind of groundbreaking technology, it's almost a given that the people of the Pokemon world would make other applications for it as well, like for instance, the convenient space-saving storage of just about any item you can imagine. The concept of an item ball is something that hasn't ever been touched on in the games to this point, but that doesn't mean that it can't still be there, and from where I'm sitting, its existence seems pretty convincing to me. Well, there you have it. Three theories that aren't realistically true at all, but sure make a whole lot of sense. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you are new for more Pokemon content. 
With that said, I'll be back very soon with another video, and until then, as always, thanks so much for watching this one, I love you all very much, and I will smell you guys later.